Today's chart princesses tend to be cute and adorable puppets or pouting wannabe strippers. My next guest has rebelled against both stereotypes with a song and clip that raised Botox eyebrows around the world. That's not easy to do. Here's a sample of Stupid Girl. Maybe if I act like that, flipping my blonde hair back, push up my bra like that. Stupid girl! Please welcome the determinedly different pink. European. <laughs> Welcome, Pink. I, I, I confess to being vastly relieved. I so nearly wore that outfit myself today. Yeah, <laughs> that might have looked a bit strange. Don't you hate it when it happens? Yeah. What did you think of uh, television Night of Nights last night, the Logies? Honestly. Yes, please. The performance was fun. The performance the, was great. Yeah. There were women in the audience that were hilarious and laughing and mm -hmm. screaming, which was interesting. And then I sat in the audience for about five minutes. The longest five minutes of your life? <laughs> Stupid Girl is interesting. It was in, inspired by that Aria Levy book, uh, Female Chauvinist Pigs, about raunch culture, or partly inspired by that. I actually, once I wrote that song, things started coming to me, yeah. sort of, and that was one of the things that I found after I'd done the video. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got that yeah, the wrong yeah. way around. But they're tied in together. Yes. Can you tell me what it is that's... that's the way that she explains it in her book is a lot more eloquent. And um, she has a lot more statistics to back it up. <laughs> I just go with feeling. Yeah. Um, Very hard to put statistics in a chorus, though. It is. <laughs> $150 billion cosmic cosmetic surgery industry. It's too many. No. <laughs> Carry the two. <laughs> no, it would be hard. But can you can you summarize what it is that's stirring you up about uh, sort of sexed up, dumbed down girls? I can try. Yeah. There's a new tabloid every six weeks, it seems. Um, there's one force-fed image of what a woman is supposed to look like, how she's supposed to act, how many big words she's allowed to use in a paragraph, what shoes she, she should have. Um, in order to be sexy, you have to be stupid. Um, in order to be successful, be less challenging, don't contribute anything to the world because it's not cute. Um, just all of these just perpetuating stereotypes that I just find so boring and so nauseating. If I want to find a strong woman, I have to Google her or look for her. If I want to find out who's divorcing, I can just open up a magazine. Uh, uh, the, you know, there's references, very clear references in that clip, for, you know, to all our favorites, Paris Hilton and Jessica and Nicole Richie and so on. Have you met any of these girls? Yes. And I don't think any of them are stupid. So why um, you can't be that successful and be that st and be stupid? I think it's an act, and it's the act that I can't respect. But sort of what I was doing with Stupid Girls goes against my idea of feminism because feminism is st um, supporting other women first and foremost. But the problem that I have, where the conflict come in, comes in, is I can't support that. I can support them. I can't support that. The action. So I'm still trying to figure it out. You said there have been times where you've used your sexuality as part of your image. Have you ever felt suckered by that culture? Did no, you... for the one, for the sole reason that I don't think there's anything wrong with being sexy or sexual um, or sensual. Um, I just don't think it comes with a price tag of dumb. I think that, of course, I'm I'm a very sexual person. I do love to be naked. I think the entire world should be a nudist colony, but <laughs> I do. So you haven't been to my house, Pink? <laughs> no, but I've heard about it. Is that right? <laughs> um, yeah, but I, at the same time, I can be, I can try, at least. I'm not going to say I'm sexy, but I can try and be sexy. I can feel sexy, and then I can tell you about how to log on to a PETA website and how to support animals and create no fur policies at, at the doors of clubs in New York City or... Um, write letters to Prince William and, you know, I can, I used my, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with shopping, there's anything wrong with escapism, I'm just saying 
I would love to see a little bit more balance. That's all I'm about. The the group who are most pressured probably by the by the need to be hot, be sexy, are adolescent girls. Yes. You get a lot of letters from adolescent girls. What sort of things do they say to you? At first it was, I love your hair. <laughs> and then it got um <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and oh, then, the art of letter writing isn't yeah. dead, is it? No. <laughs> and then it became more of um, songs like uh, Just Like a Pill started coming out and Don't Let Me Get Me and Family Portrait was a, a, a big one for a lot of people. The letters started changing to thank you for being different, thank you for not you know, going out there and abusing yourself to be stick thin, thank you for speaking your mind. Um, and now it's almost become like I joke that it's for me albums are more like group therapy for 999 because it's more like okay um, I live with my grandfather my mother just died he was raping her now he's raping me and my dog just died and I was gonna kill myself today but I put your album on and I think I'm gonna live another day it's very inspiring for me and humbling and I understand now why I'm here I guess you know more about adolescent turmoil than, than a lot of people. And in fact, you describe yourself on this album. You talk about that pissed off, complicated 13 year old girl. Yes. And you were an angry 13 year old. Uh, but I think we got a photo of you, would have been at around this age. And oh. you, you, you certainly look angry that someone's put you in that top. I was. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen the pants. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, were you, uh, what were you so angry about? That was around the time where my parents finally split up, and I think I was still reeling um, from, from the five days I think I'd spent in a quiet house. I wasn't used to it being so quiet. And how did your anger over the years express itself? Um, well, my dad left, and then I figured out that I had a lot more freedom without him there, and the house was actually a much more peaceful place without them fighting all the time. So I did a lot of drugs, ran away from home, and pretty much lost my mind. Well, I was about 15 years old when my mom kicked me out, dropped out of high school, had a record deal six months later, and haven't had or touched a drug since Thanksgiving of 95. It's just, you, know, you say you did drugs, but... That was you... a huge whole life story in about 30 seconds. That was good. <laughs> You say they drugs, but you used to, before you took them, you used to look them up to yes. check what they well, did. Well, both my mothers are nurses. Ah. Very much into the medical books. So you were like a rebel with a get-out clause. Yeah. <laughs> That's very... I like to be educated. I wanted to know what I was putting in my body and, and, you know, why do you wake up with a hangover when you drink? Well, that's because, you you know, your brain swells and blah, 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 and, and I want to know what ketamine in it. Oh, it's horse tranquilizer. So maybe I shouldn't take as much as they give a horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Very smart to leave your options open for the Kentucky Derby. Well done. <laughs> yeah. it, that's interesting, though. That shows that, like, even though you're rebel rebelling and angry and, you know, all that adolescent at sea, that you were I still was had still your head. still a control freak. Yeah. <laughs> you, were, you had a reputation as being a tough kid. Is that how you saw yourself? Yes. I still have that reputation, but it's, it's um, less and less deserved, I think. Your dad was a Vietnam vet, yeah. and he used to, I have this image of this sort of Pink Panther thing he used to do with you, where he'd train you up in self-defense. Yes. What did he do? Yeah, he's insane. <laughs> I grew up with rocket launchers in my garage. Um, he wanted me to know how to defend myself. Mm. I think he wanted sons, um, and I had an older brother, and I was completely a tomboy, and I wanted to learn how to wrestle. I wanted to learn how... If someone touches you like that, you can twist their wrist around and put a seven-foot-tall guy on the floor, which I've seen my dad do, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and I'd walk around a corner, and he'd clothesline me, and I'd be on my back reeling, and he'd say, always be on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. So it was like the Pink Panther. Every time you came home, you didn't know where he was coming from. <laughs> so yeah. if you can put a seven-foot guy on his back just like that, you must be awesome with foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> in a slightly less violent way. Sure. And, <laughs> and maybe that's, that's been too personal. You, you, you... Uh, it's maybe. too late for too personal with me. Is that right? 
You took the name Pink partly inspired by Mr. Pink from Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. But also because you blushed. Were you not as tough as you were making out? No, the most sensitive people come off as the most tough because our shell, our shell has to be that much harder than everybody else's so that the mush inside of us doesn't get bruised every time we hit a corner too hard. So what sort of stuff made you blush? Oh, anything, really. Um, the, the odd instances where someone would compliment me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, no one used to be able to watch me as I sang. I made them turn around. So when someone complimented you, is that because you saw yourself as an unattractive person or an untalented person? Absolutely. Yeah? Yes. Singing was the one thing I knew I was good at. It was the only way I could get people to shut up and listen to me. Your parents at one point uh, banned you from watching MTV because they thought it was inappropriate. So yeah. when you said, I want to drop out of school and be a singer, <laughs> are we talking shouting matches here? The shouting matches started when that picture was taken. Um, my mom tells me that the year I turned 12, I cried every day. And that was, I think, 9, 10, 11, 12 was like a, a dark period. But I always said, since I was in kindergarten, I'm going to be a singer. I, mean, I, don't, I, I know you're not okay with it, but you're going to have many years to get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Janis Joplin was your hero. Yes. So, so when, you, when you left school to become a singer, what was your ambition? My ambition, my ambitions were very simple, um, and it was always the same. I'm going to get legally emancipated when I'm 16. I'm going to drop out of high school. I'm going to hitchhike across the country, and I'm going to sing on the Venice Beach boardwalk until I get discovered. And is that what happened? And then I'm going to be a big rock star. I'll never have to conform. I'll never have to be anywhere on time. I won't have to do anything I don't want to do, and life's going to be perfect. <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in that the collision between your image of the music industry and the music industry because your first album actually went gold mm -hmm. and here you were you were naturally rebellious and that was also your image and then the record company sent you out on a tour supporting the boy band in sync who yes. were not exactly i would have thought rebellious what was the pink strategy that they outlined to you well my song there you go at the time was like a huge anthem for young girls and that's what that audience was young girls from two up till about Nine and a half. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was perfect. It was their anthem. Yeah. So that was it. I had, I performed three songs in and out. That was my tour. <laughs> and did you learn anything about the business from watching NSYNC? I learned back? that my bus driver was a pedophile. And it was the perfect venue for him. So we sent him home. Ooh. And that's when I started to learn that you have to really be careful who you're around. And a lot of things were happening in that time with management and behind the scenes. Um, I learned to keep my eyes open and that it's not just a free ride once you get here. That's when the work starts. Well, you obviously picked up on that lesson because your next album, Misunderstood, sold 12 million copies. Yeah. And uh, here's a sample. 16. 16. <laughs> yeah, but we, we work on a different sales okay. system here. You know? <laughs> We're in the Southern Hemisphere, you know. Uh, here's a clip, uh, the big breakout hit, Let's Get This Party Started. I was actually dating that boy when I met my husband now. Is that right? Yeah, I, I bet, dated him for like two days. I bet he loves. <laughs> I bet he lo your husband loves seeing that clip. He loves it. Yeah. The thing about that album was not only did it sell somewhere between twelve and sixteen million copies, <laughs> depending on which hemisphere you live in, but uh, it, a lot of people talked about it because you were twenty-one and you basically said to the record company, "I want to do it my way." What was it that the record company wanted that you didn't want? Um, they want what a record company is good at. They want to sell records, and they want to if it's not broke. Don't fix it. I sold, I guess, four million worldwide on that first record, and um, they, you know, that was lucrative enough for them, and I had different ideas. So, how hard is it to persuade them? Depends. What do you have to do? You have to be very passionate. And for me, it was my famous quote was, I'm not doing it, send me back to McDonald's.
I'm not doing it. Send me back to McDonald's for the first four years of my record deal. I'm not doing it. Send me back to McDonald's. Um, so <laughs> that helps. Um, I just said, look, I understand where you're coming from. You're living in fear. I live in love. If you want to come over to my side of the fence, let's have fun. That is so 60s. That's beautiful. <laughs> where do you get the chutzpah for that? I don't know, but for some reason, I mean, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I will continue to, hopefully, but I just, there are some things that I just know in my gut that I need to do or that are going to work for me in my life. What's the best mistake you've ever made? I think, I, I don't believe in regrets. I don't really have, I have one regret that when my mom did kick me out of the house, I had an opportunity there to spend some time with my dad. But I was so gone at that point that I feel like I wasted about six months of my life that I could have spent with my dad. But everything happens for a reason. I think that's my one regret in my whole life. You mentioned earlier about Prince William. <clears throat> You're not lacking in confidence at all. Can you explain the, the Prince William 21st birthday party invitation? I like to use everything as an opportunity. Um, he invited me to come sing at his 21st birthday. And how, how does an invitation arrive from Prince William? Like a letter. It wasn't constant messages on the answer <laughs> machine? No. <laughs> like, I'm so totally wild about you. <laughs> no, was, I think it was a letter or yeah. something mm. or a call from management or something. Yep. So I wrote him a letter saying, um, thanks for the invite, but <clears throat> recently I heard of your escapades in Africa hunting and I don't agree with the way that you live and if you want to change or be educated on it I'm here um, if you have changed by your next birthday I'll perform at that one he never wrote back I didn't get that next birthday invitation <laughs> <laughs> let's go back into the, the whole business of dealing with the record industry your third album didn't mm -hmm. sell anywhere near as well as your mm -mm. first or second and uh, and you know as better than I do how record companies research everything what works, why it doesn't work, who it works for. Yes. So what sort of conversations do you have with the men in suits at that point? Ever since my first record and I learned what... Shake my head. It's okay. No, I just... It's just the thing about putting seven-foot guys on the floor. <laughs> I'm not... If I go like that, don't yeah, shake my I'm, head. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, nice to meet you. Here's your song. Go sing it like that. Your check's in the mail, right? That was my first record. Really? So I promise never to do that again. Um, I want to know where you've come from, why you love music, what's your deepest fear, and take your pants off. <laughs> Not like that, but let's be vulnerable. I was about to do that, sorry. I... <laughs> Which kind of brings me nicely to your husband. Um... <laughs> I'm always good for a segue. <laughs> You got married uh, not so long ago, and of yeah. course your parents been through a divorce, uh, yes. and his parents been through a divorce. That must have been many times a big thing to do, right? Yeah, it was. Um, it was interesting just having the rehearsal dinner <laughs> <laughs> with them all in one room. Ooh. So when when the wedding happened, when you're there at that moment at the altar, what was going through your head? <sighs> I was so nervous. Yeah. No one told me that he was standing there for ten minutes after the flower girl had already gone down the aisle and I was just kind of hanging out and bullshitting with my dad. <laughs> and he was standing there starting to sweat. And he asked everybody, he's like, should I be nervous? Because it, and no one told me. So I finally got there, I was really nervous. He was nervous, he made me nervous. And then he said his vows and it all melted away and I cried and every, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. He was the most romantic, perfect thing on two legs. <laughs> It's lovely. And it's still like that? I've seen him four times, so yeah, I haven't had much chance for it to change. <laughs> it's a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> Is it true you have a bullhorn to uh, shout at him through? Or no, no uh, once. Once. <laughs> I have a really big problem with people that walk away from arguments, because I like to stay there and just get it going. And he likes to walk away. So I get bullhorns and knives and... <laughs> I things. can see why I might be walking away. <laughs> no, that's if he walks away. Oh, if he, yeah. <laughs> if he stays, I'm perfectly harmless. <laughs> Don't move, I have a point to make. 
you, you've talked about kids. You said, I might like to corrupt a child one day. Yes. What kind of a girl would you raise? Um, well, I always think about that. What would, what would this person rebel against? Um, so they'll go the opposite. They'll want to, you know, do ballet and play chess and, Mommy, I want to wear my dress. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't really know <laughs> if my per parental skills um, are obvious by the way I raise my dogs, then I'm going to be a terrible parent. I'm going to have <laughs> terrible children. What do you do to your dogs? No, they're spoiled. Oh, they I don't see. listen. Right. They do what they want. They swim in my pool. They don't even greet me at the door anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, I walked into my house. I'd been gone on a promo trip for two months. And it was summer. And I walked into my backyard, and I have a rescue dog named Bailey. And I have rafts in the pool. And Bailey was on his back. <laughs> I have a picture. I can prove it. On his back, sunning in the pool. <laughs> and I jink there's a bell on the door, and I jingled it to let him know I was home. <laughs> Two months. And he was listening to Christina Aguilera. <laughs> You said uh, some years ago that uh, you think you'll be dead by 27, which is the same age that oh, Janis yeah, Joplin died. Oh, yeah, that tragic thing. Yeah, you're 26 now. What do you reckon? I reckon <laughs> that I'm going to live till I'm 186 <laughs> because I'm a hypochondriac. Because I'm a hypochondriac, my friends are convinced that I'm going to live forever because I think, I mean... I think everything's wrong. I had, I have these, um, I like to call them beauty marks. Um, this mole. Um, <laughs> I had a, like a pimple yeah. near it or under it or something, and I thought I had skin cancer. And I was, I had like a week to live. I was writing yeah. goodbye letters. <laughs> I swear, I went to the dermatologist. I was like, I don't want to know. <laughs> but there's something wrong. <laughs> He came back, he's like, you have a zit. <laughs> Would you like some face cream? <laughs> the incidence of death from zits is actually quite high. <laughs> I want to leave you with that thought. I want you to relax with that thought. It's been Thanks. charming to meet you, Pete. Thank, Thank you, you very too. much. <laughs> Thank you. Nakedness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm... Mm -hmm. And that's just what I did. <laughs> what about what you did? I can't tell them that. No, absolutely not. It's enough rope up very late tonight, 9.35 with Pink. See you then.